Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. I, uh, what do you read? What do you read about, uh, you know, for industry stuff? When you want news, what do you read? Like your rags, your mags. Rags, well, rags and mags. My rags and mags? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah. Entertainment Weekly is my... Is um, that your, that's your go-to mag. piece? That's, that's just for, you know, that's a nice, fun thing. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I'm all over the place. It really depends on what I'm in the mood for and how heavy I'm wanting to get into stuff. 
Uh, I... There's a couple great websites that I look at, like screen ra- screenwriting related, like go into the story. That's a great um, screenwriting focused website. Uh, you know, Variety has a lot of good news bits in it, which are obviously more business related, uh, as does Hollywood Reporter. Um, for film score related stuff, there's a, a great site, Film Tracks, that I, I look at. So okay. I, you know, I'm all over the place. It really depends on on what I'm focusing on, I guess. Mm. All right, all right. I, you know, I read all the geek stuff. I read like the heavy geek. Uh, you know, magazines and photography magazines and, you know, videography stuff. But I don't I don't do like I don't have any sort of industry magazines uh, and sites that I um, that I read. And we've been doing the show a long time now. I'm starting to think to myself, you know, self, you should probably learn something. <laughs> you should probably be a, <laughs> up to up to date. Mm-hmm. That's you what need I'm to get thinking. serious. I do. What have you? Uh, what have you watched? Uh, what have you seen this week? It's been a big week. Um, well, I saw two things in the theaters. I saw The Hunger Games, and I saw Twenty One Jump Street. I don't and... even know. I don't even know where to start with that. <laughs> well, uh, Hunger Games I enjoyed, but it didn't knock my socks off. Okay, so we're going to start with The Hunger Games. All right, that's fine. Yeah, and you know, it's funny. I I didn't even think about using this as a tie-in last week, but we were talking about going to see it, and then we went right into Clute and didn't even bring up the fact that Donald Sutherland is in both of them. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Missed an opportunity right there. Well, you just did it. That's fine. There you go, yeah. A week late. I saw it. I did. I did see. I saw three movies this week. I had a catch up week, and oh, wow. uh, and so I saw um, Journey Two. Mm. Uh, also with uh, speaking of tie ins, also with uh, what's his name, the kid, Pita, yeah, right. Pita, right. Pita. <laughs> what was that? So, so dumb. Uh, well. So I saw Journey Two, and and that was exactly what I needed it to be. I took my kids. They loved it. They had a blast. Giant and lizards. It was... So much better than Star Wars Episode One and Three D. <laughs> it was. It? <laughs> it was so much better than that. It was so much better. Uh, it was. Uh, okay, so that you know, honestly, what what can you say about that? Other than I very much look forward to the uh, the moon, uh, uh, the right uh, Earth to the Moon thing. Yeah, that'll be fun. The the threequel. Uh, okay, so I saw that, and then I saw uh, also in the spirit of. <sighs> I don't know. Is it even count as catching up? I saw John Carter. Oh, yeah. I okay, did. I did. Okay. Well, we should talk about that briefly, just so uh, yeah. we can appease all our listeners who've been on the edge of the chairs waiting. You are such <laughs> a you're see. such a killjoy, <laughs> buzzkill, spoil sport. No, I, I'm sure I'm sure everybody wants to know because no. I've, I've been so nasty you, and you've been so supportive. You and now me- one of us have been seen mean it, so. and snarky. <laughs> okay. Uh, Andrew Stanton. I I just I, I he's on my list mm-hmm. he, from my bromance list. The the friends who haven't met friends you yet. who haven't met me yet. Yeah, and still this who who wrote this movie? My, Michael Chabon. And uh, did he? Oh, that's sad. They just it was uh, this this movie. Uh, it it was not. A problem with a material. It was not a problem with the performances. It w- it was a problem with the script. Mm. This was a sh- sh- re- hold my tongue crappy script. <laughs> this was this was a uh, this was all good planets coming into orbit around a, 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 a you know all good moons coming into planet around a, 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 a coming into orbit around a planet that's you know made of like volcanic rock like there's just no substance to it and it was oh. it, it was just a lot uh, uh it's just a lot of exposition and and uh I, it was not it, it was not well conceived and that that was really hard to watch because i wanted to really love it and and yeah. uh, there were some i mean you know there, there are some great movies that are that are that that are built on complex sort of story structures, right? I mean, God, what is Raiders of the Lost Ark is like, you know, it's a, a drama in, or an action movie in seven acts. 
acts. You know, I mean, it's like it is it, it is epic and sprawling and, and right. you care deeply about the characters um, that are written before you. And and you can tell that that this movie was was written in such, you know, sort of dear concert with the uh you know with the director and with the actors and that it was a partnership and and john carter man uh, it's just uh it it feels like a movie that was that was um uh, either written handed off and and the script duly ignored or uh, a movie that was written you know in sort of a ham-handed in expert way it was not it was just a tough movie to watch and i wanted riggins man i wanted riggins to to be my hero uh john carr i love friday night lights i want that guy to make the leap to the big screen and yeah and uh i hope that people can ignore i mean lots of people right lots of people have have made crappy big budget movies and gone on to do good things later sure so that's what i keep having to tell myself that this is going to be one of those movies well, he is in Battleship. <laughs> That'll save him. And listen to I'm you. Sorry. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's talk oh, about Hunger Games. Taylor Kitsch. Taylor Kitsch. I don't know. Yeah, Hunger Games. Uh, you, you know, have you read the book? Have you read the book? I haven't. Right. But Your even wife my wife right. yeah. even my wife and her friends who read the book said that it it's just missing something. And what she said it's missing is just uh, kind of just an emotional involvement with the characters. You just don't get emotionally um, invested with them as much as you did in the book. And I think that was, that was it for me. I, I didn't get connected. Like, um, I mean, I guess we shouldn't talk too many plot holes, but just like as things happen to certain characters throughout the story, I wanted to get tied up into it emotionally, but I never did. I... So it's fun. I liked it, but eh. yeah, I, uh, I'm I'm of uh, really of two minds on this movie. Um, on the one hand, I you know it is it is a movie that is made up of some really emotionally impactful moments, right? I, I see it as like a, a a sort of popcorn string on on your Christmas tree, right? Each little individual uh. kernel is just it, it it pulls on on your heartstrings in a pretty um, pretty heavy handed way. And I think I think my problem. And I'm trying not to be sort of over emotional about this movie, but I also see it as sort of the cultural apocalypse. Because, oh. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, on the flip side, <laughs> on the flip side, I mean, here it is. Have we have we come to this point? And and you know, let me say, I I sat through the movie and I found myself like there were moments where I was I I was really like I I found myself really invested in it and I I I thought that there were there were some great bits. There were some great bits. Yeah. Uh but but I felt like they were they were getting those bits by stripping away any story that surrounds uh the circumstances of putting children in a ring to slaughter one another. <laughs> and right. and I felt like that's not the fault of the movie. That's the fault of the author allowing her better demons to to get the best of her or her her lesser demons to get the best of her. This is this is a movie that I I would not ever take my children to and I was really uh, I felt ashamed of parents that I saw who took their children to this movie, young children who are watching these like 13 14 year old kids slaughter one another. And yeah. I, I felt like they should be ashamed of that. This, I want my children. I, and you know me, man. I s- celebrate violent stuff. I, <laughs> I take in absolutely horrific feats of violence into my eyes and I find a way to justify it. And I let my kids see all kinds of stuff they shouldn't see, but I won't let them see the Hunger Games because I don't want them to know that the only thing left for us to make movies about is a dystopian society where the gladiatorial combat has now become children. I found that offensive. And so, no. like, that's that's the one side of me. And the other side is, you know, I thought individual performances were okay. The, the thing that I didn't get out of this movie was any inspiration at all to go read the book. Right? Th- this huh. was not, this did not say, oh, God, I'm so interested in this story. I must go find out what's going on. And, and it, you know, apart from the fact that I, I had this emotional reaction about, you know, the idea of children in, in gladiator garb, 
I, I was not into the story. I, I felt like it was, there were some things that, like, come on, man. All right. So you have these 12 colonies, right? What do you call them? The 12, what's their names? They're called something. I don't remember. I don't, you see? Do you yeah. see? You see? 12. Uh, yeah. right. I would, uh, nothing. I don't know. Yeah. There's nothing. So this is just one. This <laughs> so, is just a, sort of the WTF moment that I, I had. That is just one that, sta- that sticks with me. They've you've got these 12. And you find out that the primary sort of the center of the co- of the, the colony is, uh, is colony, you know, whatever, one precinct. Yeah. District. District one. District, district one. District, right. Uh, they're the ones that are kind of running this whole thing, right? And so they have this plan. For 74 years now, they take all their kids and they train them. They make them stronger. Right. They give them, teach them how to use weapons. Why don't the other 11 colonies figure this out? Like, if it's a... Because they're a, poor. That, come <laughs> on, man. Teach your kids to do some push-ups. If that's the game, if you want me to get invested in this, like, none of the other colonies are, are teaching their kids how to, how to do this. St- I mean, it seemed like such a miracle that What's-Her-Name even knew how to shoot a bow. I, I was just, I, I found, like, those were the things. Woody Harrelson, what was he even doing in there? Like, nothing. They, they you know what? This is the thing. You, this is, uh, you, okay, here's it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop after this. You're taking out your John, my John Carter hatred. I am. I know. Movie. And, you know, this is totally me, right? I absolutely acknowledge that when, uh-huh. when, when I have the even slightest hint of because I'm usually right in the cultural flow, man. I'm usually in pop culture. I love things that everybody loves, and I totally. But when I go the other way a little bit, I feel like I have to go the other way a lot. I acknowledge <laughs> that about me. That's who I am. But uh, but uh, what's his name? Who who? What's his name? Uh, McKee. Uh, was Robert it Robert McKee, the story Robert guy. McKee? He has yeah. he had something that stuck with me the first time I read his book is years ago. Uh, the storybook, and the the thing that stuck <laughs> that stuck with me is when he talks about um, he talks about taking the perspective of of other characters as you're writing, and a professional writer goes in and they take you you know you sort of take this alternate character. They're all your voice, and you're kind of go around. Right. And when you when you read when you see these movies and you see these characters, particularly in adaptations, you see these characters that are just sort of shoved in there, and they're they're like. You know, they they don't look very good and they have short scenes and they're just they kind of stumble through and their transitions aren't very good. And all the other characters kind of look at them cross eyed. And you realize that what he's saying is that the the writer hates that character like they hate that character. And as such, they are going to crap all over him. It's they're going to just crap in his lemonade. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's what happened with Woody Harrelson's character and it makes me so mad like that because I think uh, you know and from what I hear that character is a very rich part of the book and a very key part of the book and and I think he just they crapped in his lemonade that's it I'm done I you know it's not uh, the first time this story's been told so you can't you can't pin this writer on being the person who decided that it was time to start putting children in rings fighting each other. No, and I don't like the other movies either, right? I don't. I had a very, I had a difficult time reading Ender's Game, right? Yeah. And and Ender's Game, there was still that level of uh, of separation kind right. of between the and that that you know I I don't know how I'm going to feel about that movie, but I'm I am bearish on it right now like i'm not yeah. excited about the making ender's game i thought it was a very difficult and complex sort of cultural story to read and so i you know well here's the thing i don't mind those stories at all in fact i find them enjoy i i enjoy those stories not like out of any sick you know you know desire to watch kids battling each other or anything i enjoy them but i do feel that they are more adult stories looking at a different type of society it is a much different thing when you take a story like that and you set it in an environment or in a medium whether it's a book or a movie where it's okay for children to actually be watching it as well i don't think children necessarily should be watching the hunger games i i i mean i haven't read it i know it's a young adult book man i saw more seven eight nine-year-olds at the theater yeah i saw this movie um, as many as them as I saw adults. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, I, it's, it's targeted to the young adults. So obviously it's going to draw on that crowd. Thank goodness, you know, battle Royale, which just finally was released in the U S you know, in the 
because of Hunger Games. Um, thank goodness they never marketed that one toward children because I, my understanding, I haven't seen that one, but my understanding is it's much more graphic and violent than this one, which actually I think even with all the killings, they, they tend to kind of play them down a little bit because, you know, they are depicting kids killing each other. But, um, you know, it's now, more of the American was the, take was on the it Japanese, versus the Japanese yeah, take. Yeah. Yeah. That one is, it, you know, I don't know. Well, their film sensibilities, I think, uh, they've Very always different. had a much more um, open way of telling stories. And, you know, the, trailer, I've seen... the trailers for Battle Royale are horrific. They're, yeah. they're terrifying. There's, I, you know, there's, I mean, there's a, not just battle royale, but I mean, there's plenty of other ones. I mean, I saw one where it was about kids committing mass suicide and it was like this, this crazy, it was like, you know, some horror movie and it was some string where all the adults were trying to figure out what was going on. And it's like, wow, it's intense. I mean, they, they make some intense films over there. Yeah, they do. Regardless they do. of whether it's kids or not. Have you seen in the realm of the senses? Yes, and I don't think I would watch that one again. <laughs> Not quite sure what the point of it was. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So that's uh, that's it. I one more. Uh, um, uh, I think. Well, it hasn't come out yet, but the teaser trailer came out for it. It got me very fired up on Facebook, which is the remake. I just I don't know why it just happened. I just discovered. I guess this has been around for a while of Total Recall. Mm-hmm. Did you know this was happening? This I did, and I I saw you get fired up. <laughs> I well, you know, it's, it's it's just a time for you getting fired up. I guess. I find myself really offended by the choices other people make. <laughs> I, no, that's that's not that's not uh, that's not all true. And usually, I don't care. I, I usually don't care about that stuff. But I've been thinking so much about like just just sort of story originality and i wonder i'm i'm so uh, you know what i see when i see total recall being remade i you know total recall i <laughs> i heard a, a review say that you know total recall was the you know whenever it was made 1990 90. the original total recall is widely dis uh, widely uh, thought to be one of arnold schwarzenegger's best films and that just took all the air out of my lungs. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding? Like, there are a lot of categories where, like, that movie ranks as best, but Arnold Schwarzenegger's best film, not even close. Not even close. <laughs> Jingle All the Way is so much better. So much better than Total Recall. <laughs> oh, the man. Best movie with a three breasted prostitute. Maybe it's uh, come on. It's a fun movie. It, no, I actually quite liked it. Two I, I, weeks. Yeah, I do too. Two weeks. I, are you kidding? It was great. Uh, but but I don't know. I mean, it just feels to me like we've we uh, OK, we've we get it. There's nothing else to write. We have to go back because we're we're out of stories now. Well, and before the funny thing is about the, the, the teaser that they released. I did not get any sense at all of the environment of the world. I mean, it's it's very special effects world oriented, but I never got any sense of Mars. I didn't get they any sense of Mars. anything other than than sci fi car chases. Yeah, they don't go to Mars. This this movie takes place on a future Earth, mm, and it is a okay. spy movie now. And Colin oh. Farrell plays uh, some sort of a uh, uh, spy caught between two, um, you know, sort of warring. Um, nations or warring factions uh in some future earth so they never actually leave the planet as far as i could tell i watched the comic-con yeah i ended up getting so obsessed by this movie that i went and i watched a lot of the footage and and a lot of the sort of comic-con clips and i, I went wait i spent way too much time thinking about it and wow. i should and and so there they made a lot of changes but it, what i mean the fact that they made so many changes to this movie but they feel like they still need to slap on you know, Quaid and Malia and all the names of the characters and the name of the film and can't right. just come up with a with an original name for a new movie after they're making right. all these changes. That just that's frustrating to me. Uh, I hear you. All right. I'm, I done. Hear you. I'm done. I'm fired. Can I, can up. I, can I just say after what? all of, of that, 21 Jump Street was one of the most hilarious films I've seen in ages and is well worth watching. I love that it's the one of probably the only um remake of like an 80s tv show that i can think of 70s or 80s um that i mean i'm not i never watched the tv show but 
um, I know it was not a comedy. This essentially kind of did what Hot Fuzz did with action movies, where this took another uh, a buddy cop story and just made it. They played with all of the conventions. They played with the high school conventions. They played with the cop conventions. They had so much fun with it. It was just nonstop fun from beginning to end. So I give it, I give it a big recommend. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I'm totally going to see. I may see it first show tomorrow morning on your recommendation. Yeah. And if, if you happened to watch 21 Jump Street, it features actually all of the people from the original show. Including Johnny Depp? Including Johnny Depp. You're kidding. Because that, that guy is in a real snoozer of a movie coming up. I can't believe he agreed to this film. I can't believe anybody who's making this film. Have you seen the trailer for Dark Shadows? I haven't, but my interest level's low because I've, you know, and, you know, to be fair to vampire fans and soap opera, the whole thing of Dark Shadows, um, I know it has its whole, you know, fan base, but I've never seen it. Um, and, and I don't know, there's just nothing about it that's ever appealed to me. And I haven't even watched the trailer yet. The trailer's really bad. Yeah. It's really bad. No, it's, yeah, it's really bad. All right. Um, Hey, Prometheus, I still, I'm still excited for that. There you go. See, there's a few yeah. things to be excited for. There's some highlights. But and after you watch 21 Jump Street tomorrow, you'll, you'll be happy. I'm excited about that. Yeah. I have something to look forward to, some light in my future. This, this, right. There you go. Let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about this movie. Let's talk about Parallax. Let's. The Parallax View. This, this, the Parallax View, yay. We like the Parallax The second view. of... I, yeah, it's a good movie. I, I I like it more and more every time I watch it. I do too. I have some. I there are some things that puzzle me about it, but uh, and and in, in general, I I really like the movie, and I like all the individual performances in it. Um, and and I also see why it didn't win any Academy Awards. Right. Of of the three yeah. movies in the paranoia, this this one is I see why this and a lot of people I've said, I you know, we've we got some some feedback of some folks on Twitter saying, you know, that this is, you know, in of the three, in their opinion, the best movie. And and opinions you know, from, a lot of people feel this way. I, I, I am surprised. I've been reading by around on the internet and there's a lot of people who feel of the three, this is the strongest of the three. Do you? I don't think it's the strongest. i I think of the three I still would go with all the president's men. Yeah, but I think for people who I can see why people would say that because you know this is, I mean, all the president's men essentially is kind of a a dramatic thriller, right? It's it's much more drama as you're following these guys trying to uncover truth. Um, this is much more of a thriller. So if you're looking for more of the thriller type of story, I think you're going to get it here. They both deal with you know suspicions of the government and paranoia and all that. But I think one's more thriller, one's more drama. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. In in so many ways, and we'll talk obviously more about uh, all the pre presidents spend next week, but it, in so many ways, this, this movie feels like the fictitious prelude to the movie that, uh, you know, Alan Peculia wanted to make in the first place. Like, really, let's, let's like, he, you could feel he's just sort of an activist director. And like he wants to, he, this was, we talked last week about how we're, we're getting into the culture of paranoia and the culture of, of like watching trust break down around us. And, and this was his era. I mean, this was a guy who, who you could, you could tell really understood the patterns of paranoia and the patterns of trust and the pa patterns of conspiracy. And, uh, it feels like all the president's men was a, um, was the brass ring. He just needed yeah. a story to get there. And the parallax view was, was, an initial stab. That's what it felt like to me. Well, I think the parallax view feels like, and I think you're right. It feels much more like, um, a story. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> I guess it's just different types of presidential conspiracies, right? This one feels much more like, uh, it, it is, I shouldn't say it feels like it is much more of a conspiracy thriller about the conspiracy behind an assassination which by nature ends up right. being much more, uh, much more of a thriller type of thing. And then all the president's men is the conspiracy behind just a government yeah. blunder. 
So, well, you know, pl- y- yeah, I, you know, blunder, I think, is maybe soft selling. Yeah, his, well, it his is. Presentation I, I, of it. I'm, yeah, yeah, I am soft selling it quite a bit, yeah. but if there's no one getting killed. There's no, it's not as dark of a, of a look at the conspiracy behind what a government can do. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Like, right. the, yeah. Well, it, it felt like a, it felt to me like a response to the to you know like it, it was his response saying <laughs> see told ya like yeah there there really are idiots trying to control destiny political destiny and we mm-hmm. you know but this movie so let's start, we, um, we're getting I'm I'm letting us get roped into the discussion of next week's movie but this movie you're, you're just still all agitated I'm <laughs> agi- I, I am you got yourself right, worked into a tizzy. <laughs> <sighs> So, so quick, so rundown of the story. So there's a, there's a news reporter, uh, a journalist who, um, three years after a, a very much kind of an RFK sort of political figure is assassinated, this girl, ex-girlfriend newspaper reporter of her, of his comes to visit him saying every, she was there and she says, everyone who is in these pictures um, has been killed or is getting killed. I'm on these pictures. I'm afraid I'm going to get killed. He doesn't buy it. But the next thing we know, of course, she has been killed. He starts following the evidence that she had left with him and he gets into this whole thing, embroiled, um, evading, getting killed himself, finds about out about this organization called the Parallax Corporation um, that it sounds like is recruiting assassins. So, as a reporter, he convinces his boss to let him go undercover, and he gets embroiled in this whole thing, and, you know, craziness ensues. Paranoia ensues, I really should say. Paranoia ensues. Yeah, uh, okay. Warren so, Beatty plays our lead, Joseph Frady. Joseph Frady. And let's, uh, the, we, I don't know, I feel like uh, it's spoiling it. To, I think to, I think it, we have to. It's it's pretty. It's fair to. Uh, Let's just say if you haven't watched this movie, go watch it right now. Pause and go watch because we're there will be some. It's, we're going to really be some talking spoilers. about everything. Yeah, we're going to be giving away. Besides, all. the movie came out in 1974. If you yeah, haven't so. had time to see it, <laughs> tough. You deserve it to be spoiled on you. All right. Yes. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, we're doing Alan J. Pakula's uh, Paranoia trilogy. This is a screenplay by David Geiler, uh, Lorenzo Semple Jr., uncredited Robert Town uh, of uh, Our Man of Chinatown and other wonderful scripts. Yeah, and uh, um, David Geiler went on to um, to be involved with Alien. Of course, he uh, helped yes, uh, Walter yes, Hill yes. produce that one. Uh, so, and it's based uh, yeah, on the. It, I I did not know until it, that this was actually based on a book uh, by yeah, Ryan Singer. It, and you know what's interesting? I read the script for this, and the script I think was. I'm assuming. Um, I don't know how much earlier it was written before the actual film was made, but it is so different. Um, in the script I read, and I'm wondering if the script that I read is much more close to the novel that Lauren Singer wrote. In the script that I read, the um, the character Joseph Frady is actually a cop, and he is he's a detective at this office, and he a lot of the st- setups the same, except the whole thing is much more um, related to a presidential assassination like JFK. And he was actually present and with this other reporter, and she's afraid that they're both on the list. And so then from there, it pretty much is similar. Um, a lot of stuff changes toward the end, but um, it's very similar. And I think what happened was because of the changes in society, they opted to change it from a cop to a reporter. And a lot of that, I think, was because of Watergate. They felt with these reporters busting Watergate, they felt, you know what, let's make our lead for this film a reporter. Um, and because the year before, there was another film that was made called Executive Action right. that was a version of the JFK assassination. I think that they opted to change it from a JFK-type assassination to more of an RFK type of assassination. Right. That's just my assumptions, but it seems pretty logical based on how things went down. That's interesting. 
The yeah. uh, so what are the things that uh, what are the things that stick out to you about how the movie was uh, how the movie was uh, architected? You know, I think in both of the cases so far, Clute and this, again, um, it's interesting that you just w- use the word architected because um, the architecture in the films becomes so important. The nature of how they frame the shots becomes so overbearing with the characters. You have these enormous, in this building, like the parallax building that he's going in and out of, just this enormous like glass and metal structure and he's just this little tiny figure walking in and out of it or the escalators and all that even when they're up at the up at the dam you know it's the environment is always overwhelming our characters and it's really interesting the way that they shoot that and i i uh, and put the the characters almost like making them so insignificant you know i I I think that's really 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 true. I was yeah. I, you find yourself really sort of sucked into the to the locations, and it starts at the I mean the very first shot. Uh, it, it the the film opens on a totem pole, and as the as the camera sort of tracks left, we see uh, that the totem pole has been obscuring the Seattle Space Needle, which is this giant figure. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, so everything, um, from then on, you know, every setup is shot with this sort of just giant scale in mind with just seems like very long lenses from very far away. And I think the implications of that, of, of how each scene, each setup is staged for the actors and what the, what, you know, the, the sort of trickle down effect that that has on just sort of the editing process. Uh, is it, it, it makes a uh, sort of it's a big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I found you find yourself sitting there, and I I wonder what your thought is on this. Uh, in particular, a shot that that stands out to me is the um, uh, the the escalator shot, where at the mm-hmm. you know toward the end you have Joe Frady who is uh, uh, following <clears throat> one of the parallax. Uh, the the assassin the assassin right, right? he's one of the, the parallax man and uh and and the parallax man goes gets on this escalator and rides the escalator all the way to the top right and the escalator is this giant white sort of structure and you see the grid of the the sort of the ceiling tiles lit and then after the 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 guy the parallax man gets off the escalator then we have to wait for warren Beatty to get all the way from one side of this giant screen all the way to the other side uh of of the screen like there's an impact on the scale of the film the pacing on the film when you stage a film like this right oh yeah yeah it i mean it's not paced as quickly as like a modern day thriller is where you, you're cutting 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 from uh, you know with these actions and you're removing a lot of that filler in the middle what happens when you leave that space in there and you you have such a wide angle shot where you've got this you know escalator just going all the way across the screen and you're waiting while your characters go all the way across it it really does um let you put yourself into the place of this immense world that these people are inhabiting and how like i just said how insignificant they are and it makes um it it does in a way end up building more tension into the moment because you feel like it, it there you're you have no way to uh control anything in this in world that's so overbearing with you the uh you know the same goes for the for just the opening assassination you know when they're they're scuffling on the top of the space needle and it's this the giant sort of curve sort yeah. of swells across the right and bottom of the frame and then you have all of seattle and the and the sort of harbor um uh you know all out in in front of you as the as the waiter rolls off and and you're just it's it, it's really humbling sort of cinematography this is again uh Gordon Willis, yeah, as and and interestingly, no music is played through that. It's played very straight. You know, we barely hear the guy scream because as he plummets off the side, his voice is just sucked into the environment. Right. You know, it's just it really does put you into this place where you're just like you're dwarfed. The uh, it it. Yeah, it it's more of that same sort of uh, playing with audio thing, 
that we talked mm-hmm. about last week where where you know he really uses individual voices voices in a crowd um i think even more expertly in this movie than in clute um to move the story along i mean every every crowd while a scene has you know has some has some meat to it yeah yeah and and you have a scene like where he meets up with his um i think it was a former fbi friend at like this kitty train ride I love I love it's, that. It's a genius scene. And you see them riding. And it's not, I mean, there are shots on the train with them, but you also have this shot from across the yard as, you know, on a wide angle lens, as you just follow these guys. And they're just little figures on this train, just kind of circling the park. But you can hear them as if you're sitting right next to them. It's a really interesting way to play that scene. Uh, you know, speaking of of those really long conversation scenes, you, one of the things that I I notice is that he doesn't they they don't give you reaction shots in this movie. Do you notice that? There's there's not really any. Yeah, you're right. It's it's very much you know you just set something up and you pay it off and you don't worry about the reaction to it. Yeah, yeah right. uh, you know it, the the only I think there are key there are two or three key reaction shots that that you you just you have to see for placement usually placement of the assassin but there is a, a early scene where Warren Beatty is talking to the editorial team at the newspaper and they are or or uh, no he's been it, it was when he was arrested right 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 and all the cops are in there and and he's talking it, it is very much a conversation right it's it's yeah. not a monologue. Uh, but it, but the camera stays on Beatty's character the whole scene. Yeah, it in a way it's almost kind of like a, it's almost like a documentary style sort of thing where you just happen to be in the room with these guys. You've got the one camera and you you just get the shot that you get. Mm-hmm. It's 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 pretty interesting. In a way, it kind of plays in with that um that whole vibe that uh like the conversation had which was i think just a year before this mm-hmm. where it's uh, you know it's it has that very much kind of that feel of you know everything from the perspective of uh, surveillance cameras type of thing you know right like somebody's watching which does lend to that feel it's the voyeur it's somebody watching and actually that does you know going back to that escalator shot that also plays well into the whole feeling of paranoia when you stay on a shot that long it does create a much more voyeuristic sense of things and adds to the feeling that you know cuz at this point in the film we're not sure well we have a sense that the parallax people are kind of onto uh onto um Freddy but we don't know exactly how much they know, right? Like the 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 assassin is kind of aware of him. We we've seen him, like the scene with the airplane, which is a fantastic sequence. Um, you know, we don't know that this guy knows that Warren Beatty is following him uh, until we cut to the exterior after Warren or uh, after Freddy's kind of followed him onto the plane, only to find out that this guy is off the plane and watching as Ex- Freddy is now on the plane and it takes off. Right. Um. So we don't really know what the company knows, though. Like, if he's a reporter, do they know that? Do they know that he's, you know, he was friends with this lady? Like, we don't really know. Yeah, when when there was so much at stake in the conversation immediately before it in his apartment, when the the parallax guy says, "Who are you?" Right. Yeah. Uh, so go it, ahead. It's, it's pretty. No, it's. Just, I'm just saying, it's pretty interesting when you have those really wide shots and they play the whole length. It really does lend this this nature of voyeurism and paranoia that somebody is just watching and observing and knows exactly what's going on. Right. Well, I think that that uh, I think you're. That's uh, man. That's a a really smart kind of way to look at this because uh, even from the very first shot of the Senate. You know, or I don't know the the committee. You know, the government committee. Yeah, kind it of the starts, Warren Commission. The sort war, of yeah, exactly. Thing. The commission. That's a, a you know, it starts on a on a shot that is so far back, right? You you see these, uh, you know, seven guys, and they're sort of lit from the very top, very mm-hmm. haunting. But you can't see anything around them. It's like it's yeah. this massive expanse of impregnability. Like you can't get in. Yeah. You just get to watch. Even even the script says we're not going to allow for questions. We're not going to talk about it. This conversation is over. Yeah. Uh, and and everything 
you know, every camera movement is in service of that emotional response from then right. on out. Uh, at the very end, during the the track through the the auditorium, the Hammond uh, at the at the uh, convention at the end, as the audience, we are not given any more sort of information apart from this is one of those reaction shots I was I was getting to. Apart from when they pull the the curtain back, you see after right after ba- uh, Frady passes this window this curtain pulls back and you see a couple of these security guys and they put the security badges on their coats yeah but i couldn't tell if they saw Beatty go by when i watched this the first time i couldn't tell if they knew he was there or if they just happened to if it was just a coincidence that they happened to check if anybody was in the hallway at that point it's not until later when he looks down over the edge and sees a gun right where he was standing yeah, that we learn that the whole thing was a setup. I, yeah, I mean, too... unless tell me, I mean, he, were, did you figure that out earlier? I mean, did you know that he was being set up earlier in the film? I didn't. I had no idea that he was being set up. Um, I, I thought that they thought that he was onto them, um, but I, I, I thought it was going to end differently. Like I thought it would have ended, you know, with with him trying to stop them and them trying to do it anyway. I had no idea that it was coming that he was go- that he was basically brought into this whole thing not to be an assassin, which is what he thought, but he essentially was brought in to be the patsy. You know, they brought the, you know, just like this organization needs assassins, they also need the fall guys and they need somebody that can get pinned that can have the whole thing pinned um on them. Which which ends up being a strength in hindsight, and it's what makes watching this movie the second time better, because when you see the assassination at the uh, at the Space Needle, it suddenly makes sense right. that there was a second waiter there as the Patsy. We don't know kind of what the um, you know we don't know what those circumstances were. But well, we're not even aware which one actually fired the shots at, right at that time no we're not all we see is the guy that we later see as the parallax man put his gun back in his coat yeah um so you know that that ends up being being sort of artfully crafted but it yeah. also to me is is one of the weak points of the movie allow me to tell you why yes please <sighs> uh halfway through the film we get the montage Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, where Freddy, ha- after Freddy, one of the assassination attempts, Freddy is presumed dead and takes on this alter, uh, uh, this other identity and applies to become one of the parallax, uh, you know, one As- of the parallax assassins. assassins. And yep. he's taken into parallax and they put him in this chair and they make him take this or they make him watch this video. And the slideshow, and it shows, you know, some really happy things, uh, you know, and some happy music uh, matched up with some really horrific uh, and and politically charged photos. I mean, I, that's kind of a bigger topic. Uh, do you yeah, want to talk about we the definitely, montage? Yeah, we definitely want to talk about the montage right. a little bit. So we'll get back, we'll get to, back that. to that. Okay, so when he comes out of the montage, and then you see him wandering all around the airport and he ends up kind of pulling it together and and, uh, uh, you know, on the airplane and, and ends up warning everybody before the the uh, and evacuates the plane before it blows up. But there is this part of you or of me, at least, that thinks he is going to be triggered at some point to actually pick up the gun and assassinate this guy. Right. So that's that's one potential path that Freddy right. has actually been brainwashed even though he doesn't know it and is going to run the assassination something more like manchurian candidate which is exactly what i expected the whole time right, right? i'm Got thinking it. manchurian candidate the whole time and uh and and that doesn't happen uh the we don't know that he's a patsy he doesn't stop it and at the end he is killed frady our protagonist is killed Right. Yeah. The there are like three branching paths that the narrative could have taken from the point of the uh, of the montage forward. And it's not until the very, very end that you realize which path it took. Uh, And I find that sort of it it wasn't sort of kind of decisive enough 
Like it, it didn't, I wasn't able to retrace and say, oh, I totally get it now and have a lock-in feeling. You know that feeling of lock-in when everything comes together? This movie didn't completely come together for me. It doesn't, you're, you're talking about how when you watch it the second time, you don't see those little puzzle pieces that you missed the first time that say, oh, okay, that was the moment when this happened, exactly. which led to that, right? Kind of sixth sense, how you can go back through and watch that and go, right. oh, and that's a why. Yeah, right. It's a right, lock, right. and I didn't get that lock. Did you get the lock? No, but it never bothered me because I think, and you know, and I think you know our buddy Tim. I, I say he's our buddy, but we don't have any idea who this person is. Antagony and Ecstasy, um, the the blog. Um, he has just you know a very interesting uh, article on on Parallax View as well. But there's one line in here which I think summed it up for me and said to put it another way the first part of the parallax view is about paranoia the second part is paranoia and i think what you know why that says a lot for me and in relation to what you're talking about is it's not very clear there's not a good sense as to um, like you can't retrace those steps you don't see those puzzle pieces which makes it much for me when I go back and watch it, I, I'm looking for those moments, but it may it, it does make it much more claustrophobic because you you can't figure it out. You can't figure out how they were able to put everything together and how they were able to find out who he was. And uh you it's and it makes it almost more it like makes you pull your hair out all the more with that sense of paranoia because you can't figure it out. And so because of that, I really like it. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense to me. I don't know if that I'm, if that I'm watching it with sort of, you know, 2012 cinema sensibilities that my expectation is different or my patience, yeah. my patience is too easily tested. Right. Um, and and I say that because I actually really like so much about this movie. I just didn't get the lock. That, yeah. that just feels and and so uh No, and I can understand. Yeah. I, I can see what you're saying. And and you know, I, I in general I think that I probably would want that more, but I think I don't know if it's because because of the time this was made, because of what it was representing at the time and, and really putting that whole conspiratorial thing on. Um just right out there for people um, after much more fresh after these things had happened. I mean, I think um, RFK was uh, killed in, was it 68? Somewhere around that. Yeah. It was, it was, I don't know. It was, it was within, it was under 10 years though uh, from the time that this came out. So I think it, it just is a lot more fresh in people's minds. And because Watergate had just happened, I think there was so much paranoia going on. Um, just the idea of making something so uh, puzzlingly uh, frightening. The, uh, the, the final scene, the actual assassination, mm -hmm. uh, ends up being one of the more powerful bits of this film. Um, when Hammond, uh, George Hammond is, he's riding the golf cart, golf cart down the aisle of this giant, you know, uh, auditorium. Again, that, yeah, yeah. Again, in another enormous space. Massive. And we're up in sort of the, in the rafters watching from below and, and you see him, you're on sort of a, uh, the, the golf cart Hammond POV shot, right? You're looking mm -hmm. back at him, you're affixed to the golf cart, and then he is shot, and he kind of throws himself forward. And then in what I think is one of the one of the most brilliant choices in the film, they pull back up into the rafters, and you watch the golf cart meander off track as Hammond is dying, and it starts run careening into the the tables uh yeah. and chairs pushing them out of the way as the cop cars kind of come in and people start running to see what's up yeah. um that i think is is enormously powerful it is moment. it is and and haunting it's a haunting image yeah. you know just that the 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 notion of that death is it just it's so uncontrollable it's just plowing through the tables and everything it's just uh really creepy truly yeah all right, so talk about the uh, the montage. 
Well, before I do, um, since you brought that last the scene up, I do want to say also just how much I love the moment when the door finally opens for Freddy at the end after he realizes everybody's after him Mm -hmm. and um, he realizes that he, you know, it's become obvious now that he's found this gun at his feet. This guy is dead. He's the one that they think is responsible. He's trying to escape. He sees this door to freedom and he runs for it and it's just white through the door and he, he he freezes and you cut to this just silhouette of this dark figure with a shotgun who shoots him down and that's the end. I mean, yeah. it's it's just great. So and and it goes back to the commission, right? As they and as you know, as you hear them say, "Yeah, we we're done talking about this. We think it was Joe Frady." Yeah, lone gunman, right? Yeah. Exactly. Conspiracy has been put into place. Uh, so yeah, let's. Uh, so real quick, um, I did want to talk about this because I think it's such a fantastic piece of cinema. It's. Um, what we were saying earlier, it's the montage scene in the parallax office. First of all, the setting is just gorgeous. It's an amazing piece of, of production design. It's this lone chair in this enormous room and you get this big wide shot as Warren Beatty comes in. There's this echoing voice from the ceiling tells him to sit down, put his arms, feet on the floor, arms on the chairs into the little finger things to read him and all that stuff. And they're going to play a video for him and they're going to monitor him basically. And then Frady watches this video. And as the audience, we watch this exact same video completely uncut. We never get any reaction shots of him while he's watching. It's all just again it's us now essentially it's almost like they're brainwashing the audience you know it's really really an interesting way that they did this <laughs> it's totally true yeah. uh, man, <laughs> i i did some horrible things around my house after i saw this <laughs> now the now the interesting thing about the actual piece itself is um it really exemplifies the nature of of cinema that was originally discovered back you know with like the russians like with sergey eisenstein and the nature of editing and how you can juxtapose certain images next to each other that create um different emotions you know the famous example that that um we film students in school always heard was you know you can't, you take a photo or a, an image of a a person's face, like an unexpressive face of a person, and you you cut it with um, like a bowl of soup, and the audience is going to go, "Oh, that person is hungry," and then you cut it with you know a coffin, and the people are going to say, "Oh, the person is sad. They're you know somebody's died," and then you cut it with a kid playing, and they're like, "Oh, the person is you know, reminiscing about their childhood," and just the nature of how images are cut together creates different emotions and can can put totally different things in your head that weren't there when it was just two separate images. So the nature of the way that they edit this, they use different text like ma, mother, father, God, me, and then they intercut with some photos of, of happy things, some photos of some shocking things, and the way that it and you see a lot of the photos repeating in different ways next to different words and it really starts playing with your mind psychologically as you start seeing the nature of you know what this montage video is doing with these characters in the film and it's a it's a fantastic piece of editing that was done for for this film that um i think for me really stands out as um, aside from the film itself, it stands out as an ex- uh, just a, a perfect example of the power of film um, for any age. So, well, and it's a it's a funny it's it's kind of a pu- funny place. Like, how do you as as kind of interesting an exercise as it is? How do you see it fit into the overall scheme of the parallax view, the movie? Because it sort of, I mean, it takes think, you apart from the film a little bit. It, you know, it does and it doesn't. It's, it's in a way, 
it's exactly the same thing that they're doing in the game. You know, when we were talking about the game, there's the, a video that um, Michael Douglas's character is watching when he is doing his psychological profile test. And it, it's just something that's, that's you know, sucking the, the, the evidence of who you are out of you, right? And so the idea of this, I guess, is when you cut you know, a mother's face with the word mother next to, um, uh, you know, a rose next to a child, you know, a, you know, somebody who's fit to be the assassin in the, in the world of the parallax corporation is going to have a much different reaction and a much more negative reaction to that. But they're going to have a much more positive reaction to when it says the word God and it intercuts with, with Adolf Hitler and, um, you know, somebody lynched in a tree and, um, you know, a political assassination. And, you know, the way that a person is going to react to those different images is going to change depending on the type of person that they want to hire. You know, if they're looking for assassins, it's going to be the person who's reacting in a not so normal way. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, so so that's why I think it fits in really nicely. It's um, it, it's a uh, a chance for them to kind of put us into this psychological test, but at the same time, it's also like I said, in the nature of paranoia in the world here, it's creating this psychological feeling within us as the audience, and and we're now the way that the images change with the words we're getting paranoid about what's happening within this little montage I'm, and the changes yeah, that it's yeah. making in us. It's an, it's an interesting milepost in the film. And I think now that, I mean, just, you know, hearing you talk about it, uh, gets back to the, um, the Tim article, uh, you know, that this is, that, that is the, the milepost where the film changes direction yeah, and, and changes your emotional perspective on it. Definitely. Part particularly on repeat viewing. Yeah. So how did the movie, let's talk about the numbers. Do you have it? I know it was still early for Clute. Do we have any idea of, of, uh, I looked around. I couldn't find anything. The only thing I found was one article from, um, the, uh, later in the seventies that said it didn't dent the box office. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's all I found <laughs> number wise. I couldn't even find the budget. So, um, yeah, I, I wish that I could tell you more on that count. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a great movie that has aged surprisingly well. Yeah, I think it yeah, really has. It, it is great an performances. Film, yeah. yeah, that uh, that one baby is uh, is terrific. I think he's great. And it also, you know, can I just uh, I have to plug William Daniels, who's in it as yes. the. Uh, the senator's aide. Um, for me, the most exciting thing that he's done. I mean, because he's a man who's just been acting forever. But the most exciting thing is he's the voice of of Kit Knight Rider. Yeah, <laughs> that's so awesome. I love it. Get in the car, Michael. <laughs> you can't be trusted to do anything by yourself, Michael. <laughs> but he was uh, his. I Watch think some of video. his <laughs> his best work was uh, was some of his best work was on uh, was it uh, Saint Elsewhere. Was it uh, not say? Was it Saint Elsewhere? What was the? Was that the one? God, there were so many hospital shows in the eighties. I don't know. Um, this is going to make me crazy, uh, William Daniels. It was. Uh, I just looking. started watching this. Uh, and he was also it? Dustin Hoffman's dad in The Graduate, which is great. <laughs> that's right. Totally remember that. God, he has been around a long, long time yeah. saying elsewhere yeah he was dr mark craig on saying elsewhere that's right uh in 19 gosh 1982 to 1988 that show ran uh and he was he was fantastic it's a uh, you go back i think it's on netflix you can watch the first episode of saying elsewhere on netflix it's fascinating you know how... i don't watch i don't watch doctor shows <laughs> what what <laughs> i know you have a... a thing about doctor shows I do. I don't watch any medical shows. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Where do you draw the line? Like Scrubs? Would you watch Scrubs? Two, no, that's two I, I've, I've watched it a few times, but but I, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I won't, I won't not watch them if they're on, but I just don't seek them out. 
I don't, I don't, I don't understand why it is myself, but that's good. That's going to be good for you and your therapist to work on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where now, Hey, you've changed some things about yourself. Have you changed some things? Should people, I, I are people, <laughs> I haven't yet. Okay. I All haven't right. yet. So where should I, people I find you? Uh, they can still find me at the movie monkey on Twitter and Facebook. And I am on, uh, Google Plus, but I don't know how you find people on Google Plus other yeah, than search for Andy Nelson, search. right? Yeah, pretty much search. Or yeah, or you can go to rashpixel.tv and I've got the show bios and that has links to every place Andy is to um, when you look at show hosts. Uh, you can find me at uh, Pete Wright on Twitter or uh, at, uh, of course, rashpixel.tv. You can see all the shows and subscribe to them. Make sure you subscribe in iTunes and if, you, uh, if you're if you enjoying the uh, joining us for these little talks, make sure you add some kind words. We would really appreciate Appreciate some kind words in iTunes uh, and and on our show page, so you can uh, so we can help other people find the show and and kind of know what to expect. Uh, and we actually got a request uh, from the good on our Google Plus page from the good and kind uh, Steve Sarmento uh, for uh, to do his comment, which I think is a brilliant idea. Uh, he asks, when are you guys going to review do a review of a movie that's on Netflix and host a live viewing slash review party via oh. Google Hangout? Which wow. I think is a great idea. Now, that is a fun idea. I would like to do this as a Google Hangout on air, and we should do it like we should do something once a month where we pick a movie that we talk about uh, in a Hangout on there. I think that, that would, would be, be fun. So fun. <laughs> to do and then would we also record it and put that on as our podcast or would that be that'd be an additional thing, thing. an additional thing gotcha. it'd be a, cool. a new thing a new thing to do that would we be should totally i'm very excited to do that yeah. uh so uh we're we're gonna look into how we actually do that and uh there it seems like they're letting more and more people more and more brands actually do these google hangout on air you know it's kind of one of those beta products and so they aren't letting everybody just anybody jump in but i'm seeing some kind of low rent people get google hangouts on air added to their account so i'm hoping that we are we are starting to they're lowering the bar to us (laughs) 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 so so that we'll hit that bar uh so that should be a lot of fun so that would be fun yeah Yeah, we'll definitely have to do that so we're working on that anyway that's all I got. So next week we're going to do all the president's men. Very excited about that, and uh, and then who knows what we're going to do. Yeah, when we do that one, we should actually. Uh, I know we uh, have been doing this trilogy with uh, for Alan J. Pakula, but we should actually just talk briefly about him. I, we've kind of left him out as far as his his history and stuff. So we should just throw in a little more about him, especially since it ended in such a sad way. So yeah, you're right. Absolutely sad. We'll leave and it on sudden. <laughs> yeah. And- horrible yeah. all right yeah all right well hey good talk man yes indeed yes indeed um as as always actually so don't don't let him poop in your lemonade <laughs> i won't no poop in my lemonade tonight here at the next reel we've been passionately discussing movies week after week since 2011 that's a lot of movies and a lot of conversation sure is pete and to be honest it's a lot of work too but it's work that we love. If you've been enjoying our show, we'd like to remind you that there are ways to support us, even if you're not able to become a member just yet. You might've heard us talk about our new watch page where we've listed every movie that we've talked about paired with Amazon or Apple links to rent or buy the movie. Now we'd like to introduce you to our originals page. Let's take a trip down memory lane, Andy. Do you remember what the first film we discussed on the next reel was that was an adaptation? Uh, well, let's see. It wasn't obviously our Indiana Jones series because those were all original. Uh, though we did Charlie Kaufman. Uh, oh, of course, it was adaptation uh, from Susan Orlean's Orchid Thief. Exactly. We have covered quite a few adaptations over the years, and now we're providing a way for our listeners to delve into the original source material. That's right. Just head over to thenextreel.com slash originals, and you can see the list of all the adaptations that we have discussed. From our David Fincher series, featuring The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Social Network, Zodiac, Benjamin Button, and Fight Club. To our Paranoia trilogy with The Parallax View and All the President's Men, we have covered a variety of adaptations. Those were some great discussions, especially Fight Club. And let's not forget our baseball series with The Natural and Field of Dreams, adapted from Shoeless Joe. And Up in the Air and Thank You for Smoking. So many memorable conversations. 
Absolutely. And you know what's exciting? Each purchase you make through our links doesn't cost you any extra, but a percentage goes to support the next reel in our family of shows. You can support us while diving deeper into these fantastic stories, whether it's the paper, audiobook, or Kindle version. We've also included plays and movies. If they were the source, we'd put it on there. So what are you waiting for? Head to thenextreel.com slash originals, support The Next Reel, and get your next great read today. I'm off to reread Fight Club. Now, where did I put my Kindle? <laughs>